I'm the adult services provider in the science and technology room. Um, before we begin, I want to cover just a couple of housekeeping items. Please be sure your microphone is muted to limit any background noise. That way you can all hear Mary well. And this program is being recorded. So if you miss part of it or you come late, fear not, it will be posted on the SLPL YouTube site. Uh, I want to introduce Mary Hammer of the St. Louis Herb Society. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat feature. My friend and colleague will be helping me monitor this today so that we can try to get all your questions answered. And I also wanna thank you for joining us today. Miss Mary Hammer, take it away. Thank you so much, Erica and Christine. Thanks for your help as well. I'm gonna share my screen now. And uh, the, by the way, the picture behind me is what my garden's going to look like, knock on wood, next week at this time. This picture was taken exactly a year ago next week. So I'm gonna share my screen and start. All right, so growing herbs in containers. And uh, as uh, Erica said, feel free to write questions in the chat room anytime that you wish. And I will uh, answer as many as I possibly can at the end. So just a little bit about the St. Louis Herb Society. We're celebrating our 80th anniversary this year, having been founded in 1941. We're a nonprofit volunteer organization, and our mission has always been to further the study, use, and knowledge of herbs. And our definition of an herb is very broad. It's, it's even broader than I think it is, uh, which is any useful plant. Now, trees are useful plants, but I don't really personally consider trees an herb. However, um, herbs have been used for centuries for a variety of reasons, uh, medicinally, uh, uh, for decoration, for pest control, just for beauty, for fragrance, and for cooking purposes. So there's a lot of variety. Part of what we do is maintain the herb garden at Missouri Botanical Garden. And this is in the times past when we were allowed to go. We're located right behind the Henry Shaw house at the garden. We have classes in the spring and fall. And our, we have an upcoming class in May that I'll tell you about in a minute. And in person, you get a whole big feast and lots of ideas, but virtually you will get a nice uh, packet of information as well. And this year's class is come fill your picnic basket on Tuesday, May 11th. There's a fee for this. If you're a garden member, that's a, uh, there's a discount, but you can register for this Zoom class through the Botanical Gardens website at mobot.org. They're a lot of fun. We give talks and presentations just like this one. This picture down here in the left is of a program we call Urban Heirloom Tuesdays. And we're hoping to be able to do this again this year, but we don't know yet. When, again, I'm gonna pretend this is a normal year and it certainly has not been. This is the Henry Shaw House. Our herb garden is located right back here, but. We work in the garden from eight to 10 in the morning and then from 10 to noon, June through August, we have Urban Heirloom Tuesdays. And this is when we give away a free herb plant each week, sometimes culinary, sometimes not, but to the first hundred visitors, along with a card of how to grow and what to do with that plant. We also have various publications for sale that help uh, fulfill our mission. In 80 years, we have only produced four cookbooks, and this is our most recent herbal cookery. I'll tell you how you can get a hold of a copy of that in a little bit. Our most recent publication is a beautiful book called Herbs A to Z for ages six and up, up to however old you want to be. And one thing about the, the cookbook that I love, but well, aside from the recipes, and also aside from the fact that it opens and stays open flat. You don't have to wait down the corners to hold it open to your recipe. The index is indexed by recipe, but it's also indexed by herb. So this is really useful. If you've made your pesto with your basil and you want to know other basil recipes, fine. Or oregano and parsley. I just took a picture of some of the things. This is an illustration from the A to Z book. 
where we're visiting an herb garden along with pollinators that might also enjoy those plants. We wrote the, we wrote the text and a young woman named um, Morgan Hutcherson, who's not with the garden anymore, she immediately got snapped up by some corporation for her artistic ability. She did all these original watercolors. It's a lovely book. We also produce How to Grow Herbs in the Midwest and Lauren Legend. Those are just some publications. You can find out more about all this stuff from the St. Louis Herb Society.org. If you forget that, just Google St. Louis Herb Society and you'll and it will take you to this site. There's, I'm only gonna, I'm mainly talking about growing herbs in containers, but you may want, you may have questions about harvesting them or uh, how do you, do you plant from seed and cuttings and things like that, how to preserve them, what else to do with them. There's information about these, all these topics and more on our website, as well as lots of recipes, events coming up. And this is how you can also order our publications. We just finished our herb sale. We sold out in three days. It was a virtual sale, but in the future, we hope to be back in person. We sure hope to be back in person. And we also support the Missouri Botanical Garden in several ways. We volunteer there and we support them in financial contributions. Here we're, we have funded a, a research trip to Mauritius where they're trying to save a lot of indigenous plants that are in danger of going extinct. Now herbs have been used for many purposes throughout history. We don't give medicinal advice um, because it's too iffy. Uh, uh, you know, echinacea is supposed to be good for whatever. Well, we just don't give any medicinal advice about herbs. Now, this is my garden. It's big, but I'm a lazy gardener. And I'll tell you more about that, I think, as time goes on. The picture on the left was taken the first week of March. And this, this was taken the last week of April last year. So my garden's going to look like this. The dianthus is just about ready to bloom. June, things are starting to fill in. I like to show these pictures because when you buy a plant, it's little, but you have to give it room to grow. And then September and October. And this glorious plant is pineapple sage, which is beautiful in October. I use containers throughout my garden and mix and match herbs with other flowers. And I even have herbs in my vegetable garden as well, which is back here. I've raised beds for that. So most, all of these that are in that you see here are perennials. They come back every year. And except for this one, which is lemongrass. Um, this is dianthus, a fire witch it's called. These are chives that are in bloom here. This is lemon balm, some daylilies, and so forth. So up here, I have some eucalyptus and some little lobelia and celosia and different things like that. And this says Kent Beauty Oregano. That's what this is, I'm sorry. This will flower. I'll show you pictures of that in a bit. So here's dianthus, lavender. Some lavenders do well in containers. Mint, you better keep in a container or you're going to be sorry. Kent Beauty, this is what it looks like when it blooms. It's just a glorious plant for containers because it spills over the edge. Patchouli does fine in containers if you like the smell. You can combine some plants together. This is Feather Celosia. These are ornamental peppers. And this is a little plant called Gomfrina or globe flower. I love this plant because the flowers dry and hold their color. So it's great for dried flower arrangements. Here's some parsley in a pot. This is rosemary. It looks like they're in the same pot, but they're not. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. Well, I'll tell you why right now. Rosemary doesn't need nearly as much water as a parsley. So it's when you're combining plants together, keep their watering needs in mind. This is a close up of this Kent Beauty oregano. It's ornamental oregano. It's not that you couldn't eat the leaves, it's that the leaves don't have much flavor. It blooms like this all summer and it's another plant. When you cut the flowers, they dry and hold their color. So they're really pretty in dried arrangements. Here's more of the little buddy purple with some marigolds. This is sweet marjoram, which is great in a pot. This is our 
herb garden down at Missouri Botanical. We have the main garden. These are different basils and thyme next to thyme boy and all kinds of different plants. And then we have a big a container garden with huge containers where you can plant a lot of plants together. You can come and see the, our garden now. The garden is open for visitors, uh, even though we're not allowed to work there yet. So here's a closer up of this. You can see the variety. This is a purple basil. And this is a trailing rosemary. Lots of different varieties. Just again, this is some dill that's blooming. Chives that are kind of finished with themselves. This was taken in August because of the um, brown, uh, the black eyed Susans. Now, if you're buying plants, the first thing to do is get a nice healthy plant. And a healthy plant is usually bushy and compact. It's not straggly and stemmy. Um, so when you're looking for your plants, this goes for any plant that you buy, a nice compact, well-formed plant is the best one to buy because it's the healthiest. And I say not in bloom. If you're, if you're going to pick out your marigolds and your impatiens and your petunias, you want to know the color that they're going to be. But when you bring those home to transplant them, cut the flowers off. I know. Ah, what? Yes, because these annual plants, they're going to bloom all summer. Give the transplants a little bit of a chance to establish their roots. And the plants, if the plant is putting its energy into flowering, it's not going to have as much uh, energy to put in the root system. And the roots are what's going to make the plant either survive or croak. So these are just some more, these are different basils up here. When you buy any plant, sometimes they've been in a pot for too long and it's called pot bound or root bound. And you can see because the roots are now starting to circle the space they were given tease those out. You might even have to cut some of them off with a very sharp knife, but you have to give these root ends a possibility to make contact with the soil. These roots are gonna have a hard time of it because the end of the root is all tangled up in here. So don't be afraid. Oh, this is a sad and sorry plant. What could possibly be wrong? Well. There's two possibilities here. First of all, it could be that this pot plant was just transplanted. It's very common for a plant to wilt for a day or two when you transplant it. It's, it, has, it goes through some shock. More likely with this plant is this pot is too small and the plant desperately needs water. Leading me to not overcrowding, again, I was telling Erica earlier, plants, I like to say that you all know what it feels like, well, most of you know what it feels like to have your shoes, shoes that are too tight. They might be really pretty and you might be very happy if you're sitting in a chair wearing shoes that are too tight, but you're not gonna be comfortable if you need to go any place or do anything. So any one of these plants is big enough to fill this one pot. Peppermint alone will take over everything and knock. So you're gonna lose all these plants just from peppermint alone. Basil will fill this pot. Dill will fill this pot, chives. Strawberry pots can work very well for some herbs, but not for this particular herb. This is basil and, and when it grows, it's gonna flop over and probably break the stems. You can grow a taller plant in the center but be sure not to crowd. It's very tempting, but try, try to not to avoid it. Leave some space for these plants to grow. Thyme does very well in a strawberry pot because its roots are shallow and it's a little lightweight plant. So it does, real, it does very well. You can even use some growing bags. There's plenty of room in here. So getting a container that's large enough and making sure it has excellent drainage. This is something that most herbs need. These are the plant, this is what the plant comes in. This is a four inch pot and this is a six inch pot. I would never plant any herb, even one, in anything smaller than this. So again, 
give your roots a chance to grow and drainage. Drainage means that the plant needs water, but it doesn't want to sit in water. So I usually drill, I use mostly plastic pots because I can provide that extra drainage. I drill holes in the bottom. Every place that's circled here is an extra hole that's been drilled. And then individual herbs usually do well in 10 to 14 inch pots. And that's a, a diameter. And each plant needs a one and to one and a half to two gallons of soil by itself. And you know what a gallon looks like. It's like a gallon of milk. And here's some, here's a nice photo for you. This is a seven gallon pot, about 13 to 14, 14 and a half to 15 inches across, five gallon, three gallon, two gallon, one gallon. This is a five gallon pot right here. And this is the smallest one that I use even for annuals. You could get away with a three gallon pot with a single herb. These are just some of the pots that I use in my own garden. Now, you don't have to fill the entire pot with soil. You can use those plant, those pots that the plants came in. You can crush them or old, if you have old terracotta pots that are broken, that's great. Or gravel, if you don't mind, if you're not gonna try and move the pot around, just you can fill the bottom third of this pot with something else, packing peanuts. I've even used sweet gum balls because they take up space, but they don't add any weight. The plants usually do fine with a depth to 12 inches. It's the width that they need. So you need that bigger pot. If you have beautiful ceramic pots, they usually will only have one drainage hole and that is not gonna do it for most herbs. Instead, I use a plastic pot that will, the rim rest on top. That leaves an inch or two at the bottom, again, to let the water out. Here are my pots all ready to go. I've cleaned them, I filled them with new soil, and they're all ready to plant. These are dianthus that's been waiting. Those are perennials. Here's some hens and chicks coming out. And now the other way that you want drainage to happen is you want it, you don't want to use a plant saucer, but you may want to lift your pot up off your patio or your ground or your um, deck. So you can use these are adorable little plant feet. They sell all kinds of plant feet, or you can plant plant rings. This sets the pot off just a half an inch above the ground and lets that water drain through, and that is essential. If you have some old terracotta pots, you can clean them. And this is very important so that you're not transplanting year after year. You're not continuing on with um, fungus or other disease or insects. And plus these are sort of, these are kind of a mess. These are really small pots, but you still wanna clean them if you're gonna use them at all. And you wanna replace with fresh potting soil whenever you do. You can clean it with a brush first and then you can soak pots in a solution of vinegar and water. If that's stained like this, you might have to put them in solid white vinegar, just household vinegar. You can even run terracotta pots through a quick wash on your dishwasher cycle. I mostly have stayed away from terracotta. They breathe well, but they break. And uh, so I like the plastic pots. Now, another thing that you need is nice loose compacted, um, composted soil, not compacted. Your soil should look and feel like chocolate cake, dark brown, loose and crumbly. You don't need moisture retaining soils for any of the Mediterranean herbs, such as lavender or sage, thyme or rosemary. In fact, those are detrimental, particularly for lavender and rosemary. You'll kill your plants with too much water, not cold, well, for lavender, not the cold. So loose soil, plenty of compost and full sun. Now I love herbs because they're so easy to care for, unlike tomatoes. They don't need any chemicals. They're almost not bothered by anything, no bugs, um, no, not very many diseases. They don't need to be fertilized. Here I've got some column, columnar basil and with my tomatoes, I also put it, usually put in some marigolds just because they'd help deter 
certain insects and they're supposed to deter rabbits. Well, I don't know about that. But most herbs are not usually bothered by these adorable little things. Adorable, yeah. Notice they're eating petunias. And uh, uh, I can't even think that. Of when you're planting your pot, if you do want to combine things, be sure you combine plants that have the same watering needs. I mentioned Mediterranean herbs. Those are called that because they're native to that area. They, in the Mediterranean area, has hot summers, cold winters, but not a lot of moisture and certainly not high humidity. Well, we don't have a Mediterranean climate here because of our humidity and our wet winters. And so you can plant sage and rosemary and thyme together. But if you have basil or parsley, you want them in a different pot completely. And lavender, for sure. More people's lavender dies because of overwater than anything else in St. Louis. If you have an automatic sprinkler system, keep these Mediterranean herbs away from that system. It's too much water and they'll drown. The other solution to planting herbs is to plant a different one in each container. When they're all together, they make a lovely garden. So rosemary, thyme, some basil, here's some sage, different kinds of thyme. Now, what should you grow? Well, these, these are pots of mint. <laughs> I'm gonna talk more about mint. This is in our herb garden and this is a show garden. It's not, not what you would do at home. We have three or four different kinds of mint in each of these pots and we take them out at the end of every year. So otherwise only one per pot. If you see this stem coming down, this is one of the ways that mint, mint's objective is to take over the world as far as I'm concerned. Every place a stem touches the ground, it will form, an, it will form roots and a new plant. The roots spread everywhere and they also bloom and have seeds. So mint is very well equipped to spread, but I'll show you a little more. But what can you grow in containers? Well, you can grow some agastache or hyssops. This is firebird and sunset yellow. These are plants that are loved by pollinators and hummingbirds as well. Aloe is great in a pot. It's kind of slow growing. Full sun, it's tender. You need to bring it in for the winter. This is one that was got so big I had to, I was just gonna take it out of the whole pot and save the babies because it was knocking the pot over. So um, aloe is also known as the burn plant. And that's the only semi-medicinal advice. If you keep aloe near your kitchen, if you burn yourself, open the, make a slit and put some of that gel in, in it and it will keep you from blistering a lot of times. Basil, of course, is wonderful in pots. Basils are all annual plants. That means they have one year to live and do their whole life cycle. So, but if all you planted was basil, you'd have a beautiful garden. And here's just some kinds. This is the standard, this is sweet basil. This is what you buy at the grocery store and the big box stores. And you're probably familiar with it. If you're a gardener at all for any herbs, you've probably grown basil. Easy to grow from seed. And it's this is the standard, this is the classic. However, there's about, oh, probably four or five dozen types of basils. Here's one that I love, it's called purple ruffles. The contrast in the garden is so pretty and also in salads, it's very beautiful. So purple ruffles. Here's lettuce leaf, which has the same flavor, but the leaves are ginormous. They can be as big as my hand. I really love this plant. Amethyst is another purple basil with smooth dark leaves. It's almost black in color. And again, this is a purple and green are natural nature's color combination. And it makes a pretty garden. So I want my garden to be nice for me to use the plants, but I also want to have it visually attractive to me. Here's a Greek columnar basil. This is a nice plant because this is the way it grows. It doesn't flop over, it doesn't need to be staked. Um, it has a slight lemony taste and it doesn't bloom nearly as early as the other basils. 
is this green globe or spicy globe. This grows in a naturally mounded shape. You don't have to prune it. The leaves are small and it's got a little kick to it. Now, any basil, once it starts to flower, this is true for any herb, will lose some flavor in the leaves. That's because the carbohydrates, the sugars in the plant have been diverted from the leaves into making energy to grow the flowers and then the seeds. And this is the plant's objective. It, the plant's objective is not to be made into pesto. The plant's objective is to flower and make seeds and reproduce itself. So you can keep trimming that, or if you're very patient and I'm not, I'm lazy, if you wanna pinch off the little white flowers, okay, fine. I give mine a haircut and cut it back by about a third. I grow some other basils just because I love the flowers. This is cardinal and cinnamon basil. This is Corsican and holy basil. This is used uh, in, in the Hindu religion. It's considered uh, a holy herb. Pesto perpetua is a variegated. You can see the white and green leaves. And this is a fairly new purple basil. Well, it's way, very, very dark. It's called Red Freddy. He's cute. There's Thai basils, which have some kick to them. Again, the flowers are lovely. This is Siam Queen and Sweet Thai. Next, we move on to Bay Laurel, which is a tender perennial, very slow growing. And I keep mine in a pot in the window all year round. I don't even take it out in the summer, but you can. Dried basil leaves, uh, dried bay leaves are available at the store anytime in the spice department. Hey, Mary. Yes. Speaking of the store, um, we have a question. Where would the best places to acquire a larger variety of herb plants be to go? Where would you suggest if you were shopping around for herb plants? Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to address that at the end, but any of your local nurseries are expanding their herb selections every single year. I don't know where your person lives. Uh, I have shopped, I'm in, um, I'm in Creefcore and we have Heart King Nursery. There's um, on Big Bend, there's Garden Heights has a really nice selection of herbs, a large selection of types of herbs and uh, Sugar Creek, there's, you know, there's all over the St. Louis area, any reputable large nursery will have a good selection of herbs and now is the time to get them. Your basil oh. is the last to be put in the ground really, although you can do it now. I generally don't put my basil in the ground until the second week of May. It doesn't like cold and it's just gonna sit there and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, shiver. But any good nursery is the, is where I would buy my herbs at this point in the year. You can get herbs at the big box stores too, and they're perfectly fine. Bonnie Plants makes, grows just the standard herbs. But if you want something different, try one of your local nurseries. Bay is hard to find, I will say. I'll say that, but some of the um, bigger nurseries will have bay plants for sale. Chives, now these are, uh, are the chives that you want. These are the ones that bloom purple. If you're not sure, be sure you ask or look at the flower picture on the label to make sure that they're purple because there's, a, there's an onion chive also that has little white flowers. They will spread all over your garden. But these chives are very well contained. They're a bulb, they're in the onion family and they'll spread slowly. You can divide them every two or three years if you want to. Um, but they're, the flowers are edible too. They do great in containers. Cilantro is fine for container. Now you may be one of the people, most people, it seems to me, really like cilantro. Many people love cilantro, they say. I am one of those other people, the 10 to 14% of the population who cannot stand cilantro or the scent of it because we have a gene and that gene to us makes the smell and taste of cilantro leaves, smell and taste either, take your pick, like ivory dish soap or dead stink bugs. So unless you like those flavors on your food, you probably don't like cilantro either. However, if you love it, 
you can try it. It's easy to grow from seed, but it does not like our hot summer weather. So it will bolt. Uh, you can keep planting seeds every six weeks and see if you can grow it. And like so many other herbs like parsley, you can get cilantro all year round at the grocery store too. And here's the difference. They look very similar. Cilantro begins with a C, parsley begins with a P. C is curved. These leaves are kind of curved. Parsley P for pointed. These leaves are kind of pointy. And that's the difference. Although all you really have to do is smell the plant, I think, to tell the difference. These are available all year round. Dill is another plant that, oh, did you have another question? I do actually, pardon the interruption. Um, somebody wants to know if you, can you put herbs in pots now and bring them in if it gets below 50? Oh, the annuals, treat an annual herb just like you would your marigolds and your um, petunias. We're, we're just about, we're frost free supposedly on the 15th of April. So you should be pretty safe now. A perennial herb can be out right now. You can see in my background, these are perennials that have come up on their own. I, I didn't plan them this year, they're, they're years old. So perennials are fine to keep out. So annual plants will not tolerate a freeze. They'll be okay if it gets down into the you know, even the lower 40s is fine. You don't have to bring them in. If we had another frost warning, then you'd want to throw a sheet or something over them or or bring them in at night. But by the 1st of May, everything can be put out. And can you still plant from seeds now? Sure, absolutely. Uh, those annual plants, absolutely. Now is the perfect time to grow from seed. And you could even start those in the pots in a sunny window because after all, it's gonna take a few days just to germinate. And by the time they're big enough to go out in, a, in your container, it'll, it'll be warm enough to do so. One, one nice thing about containers is the soil warms up and stays warmer longer than it would in the ground. Which is, you and then know. last question before I let you have it back again until the end of the program. Okay. Uh, what size container do you recommend for bay laurel? Well, bay laurel is a perennial plant. Let me go back to bay here. Um, this is a fairly small plant, a pot. This is probably just a two gallon pot. That's a pretty big plant for that. I would put it in a two or three gallon pot. It grows so slowly that... Um, you know, you won't have to put it in a bigger pot, maybe for five or six years or 10 years even. So if you can find it, I've had a hard time finding bay in the last few years. But again, some of the nurseries are beginning to get more and more herbs. This is a plant that probably is brought in and out through the summer. And that's probably a seven, eight gallon, seven or seven gallon pot. Okay, let's go back to our deal. Dill, I plant my dill in the ground um, be, and I have a lot of it because it takes a lot for what I want to do with it. If you let it flower, here are the pretty little flowers and then you can see some of these are already turning, the flowers are turning dark and each one of those is a dill seed. Dill is extremely easy to grow from seed and will self seed itself also, which is sort of handy. You get another crop in the fall and then it'll come up on its own in the spring. But it does fine in a large enough container because although it's an annual plant, so it doesn't need a huge container. People think it comes back every year and it does, but it's only because it's self-seeded itself. So if you have it in a pot, this plant itself is going to die at the end of the, really in the heat of the summer. Lavender is a plant that can be grown in containers and can do very well in containers, especially if it's one of the smaller lavenders. And I would recommend an English lavender, the Lavendula angustifolia. This word means lavender, it actually means to wash. And angustifolia means having narrow leaves. None of that says English. It's called English lavender because Queen Victoria loved lavender so much that many lavender products, many products made from lavender were produced in England during her reign and still are today. And so pop, they were so popular that these lavenders became known as English lavenders. 
This is one of my personal favorites, Munstead. It's a small enough lavender that does fine in a container. It's got the dark purple flowers, very sweet, and can be used for cooking purposes too. This is another one, Hid Coat. There are a lot of kinds of lavender. I do a whole lavender program, so I'm not gonna get into too many details about lavender, but try for an English lavender. They tend to be smaller and container suitable. This is Vera, this is in my garden. It has a lighter purple flower, a kind of a grayer leaf, but again, the leaves are very narrow. Spanish lavenders are great for containers, but they're not hardy here. The English lavenders will do fine. This plant is five years old in this container. I don't bring it in. It's fine all winter long. And the reason is that this container has multiple drainage holes and it sits up it sits up off the ground so the water goes through. But the Spanish lavenders are adorable. They all have these funny little tufted flowers and they're not hardy here though. So you could bring it in. Lemon balm is a totally hardy plant. It's in the mint family. A pot is highly recommended. Mint does spread. Uh, I just dug all mine up. I hope I dug it all up uh, because I don't use it anymore. I, have it, I favor another lemon plant a lot better that I'll show you in a second. But a lot of people like it for tea and um, potpourris. The leaves dry and still have some, mint, some lemony scent. Lemongrass is a plant that's used in a lot of Eastern recipes, cooking recipes. Uh, it's not hardy, but it's best in a pot because it is a grass. It's pretty, uh, but, the le but the roots go, without this pot, these roots would go down to about here. And believe me when I say it's really something to have to dig it out of the ground. So pot is really great. By the end of the summer, it will be pot bound. There won't be any dirt left in the pot, but it doesn't matter because you're gonna just put it in your compost anyway. You use the lower part of the stems and you can use them for um, skewers or for soup. Lemon verbena is my lemon herb of choice. This is a tender perennial. It will not survive a frost. However, what it does love, love, is our hot St. Louis summers. It just thrives here. So, and I keep it in a pot. This is the only plant I bring in for the winter. The rest, I don't care. This plant has many advantages. If, first of all, it grows, it'll grow waist high. And when you harvest it, if you cut here, there'll be three more stems that grow out. When you dry these leaves, they hold their scent, as far as I can tell, forever, which means in the middle of the winter, I can still have lemon verbena tea. That's pretty little white flowers, but it is a great plant, loves our summer heat. So that's, and it tastes like lemon vanilla. It's very sweet. Marjoram is a great plant. It's a cousin to oregano, but milder and sweeter. Does an annual here, so it's fine in a pot. Now mint. I think if you're gonna grow anything, you can grow mint, um, but please keep it in a pot. And here's why. This is just one year of growth in one gallon container. And it, look at those roots, <laughs> the size of my pinky. And if those get out, they're going to spread everywhere. You'll notice in this, when this was removed, there's very little dirt left in the pot. It's all roots. So if you keep it in a small pot, you're gonna to have to do this little chore every year. I keep mine in a big tub, so I don't have to divide it, but every three or four years, this is what you do. You dump, dump it out on a tarp or something. You split it apart. I use a hacksaw and I'm not kidding. I use a hacksaw to hack through the roots and I break it into sections, leaving some roots and a little bit of stem. And then I put it in new composted soil, trim the leaves back a little bit, let the roots get started, water it in. And then six weeks later, you'll have another big, beautiful pot of, of mint. Spearmint is what you want if you want, that's what, 
if the recipe calls for mint, it's calling for spearmint. And that's what you buy at the grocery store. There's all kinds of mints. There's orange and chocolate and lime, and but they don't have the same flavor as spearmint. This is this Kent Beauty Oregano. It's gorgeous, this mauvey pink color. It spills over the edge of a potter of a container. So it's really nice in combination. You could combine this with any of the other Mediterranean herbs. It's pretty with rosemary in the center. It's pretty with um, other oreganos in the center. I've even planted a pot with sweet alyssum, you know, the little white border plant. And I put that one of these Kent Beauty in the middle and a few alyssums around the edge because the alyssum grows, this one, the Kent Beauty grows a little bit taller and will spill over the white. It's very beautiful. Italian parsley or flat leaf parsley or any curly parsley too, does great in a pot. Italian parsley is a biennial plant. That means it has two years to live. The first year is what we eat. And you can pick that all summer long. The second year, it the stems are thicker and the leaves are smaller and quite bitter because now the, all the plant's energy is going to produce flowers and seeds. Parsley is easy to grow, but it's not easy to grow from seed. It's very slow to germinate. So you can buy a parsley plant or get fresh parsley anytime. Ornamental peppers are great for pots and there's a million varieties. These are two of my favorites, black pearl and masquerade. I love black pearl because of the contrast in the garden and uh, masquerade. There's another one called Medusa and it looks like masquerade except it's the, the peppers look like curly hair of the Medusa goddess. Here's a few others, purple flash, calico, chili chili. These are ornamental peppers, by the way. They are off the Scoville scale in heat. You would not want to eat these, pretty sure. Rosemary, of course, does fine in a pot. Now, rosemary, most rosemary croaked this winter. We had that blast of cold spell. We are in zone six, the growing zone six, and rosemary is zone seven, which is one zone warmer than we are. Some winters it's fine, some winters it's not. I've tried bringing rosemary in and it hasn't lasted any longer than the ones that I leave outside. So now at the end of the season, I just make a rosemary wreath and buy new rosemary. There's a new kind that we're trying this year called Hill Hardy. And I haven't, it hasn't gone through a winter yet for me. So I'm planting it and I hope it's supposed to be hardy to zone six. So we shall see. There's trailing rosemaries, which are great for containers. This is blue rain. There's many kinds. You might not get it to flower here because it doesn't flower until its second year, but if you're lucky. French tarragon is okay in a pot. It's not a beautiful plant. It's kind of a sprawly thing, but it's a perennial and it will do fine in a pot. Thyme in the ground or in a pot, in a strawberry pot. It's one that we can call a trailer and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Scented geraniums, these are not the big geraniums, the big with the huge flowers that are very popular. I grow those too, but these are scented geraniums. They are bred for their leaf scent. They have flowers, but they're smaller. But I'm just gonna show you a little variety of the leaves because they're all so different and the scent is all different too, and they're great. One of the plants that you might buy is called a citronella plant, and this is a scented geranium supposed to keep mosquitoes away, which it does if you rub the leaf on your shirt or collar or hat. It won't keep the mosquitoes away from you if you're five feet away on the deck. Here's Prince of Orange. This is also a scented geranium. There's probably 120 of these, so I'm not gonna show them all. This is Apple. This Lady Grey Plymouth, this is also called Skeleton. Anyway, you can see the variety of colors and shapes and textures. It's nice in a gardener with pots. Now, when you're designing your container, uh, plant designers always talk about thrillers, fillers, and spillers. A thriller is a plant that's gonna grow more upright. 
and be the star of the show, so to speak. A filler is just that, it fills around, it's a lower growing plant, and a spiller is one that's gonna trail over the edge. You could try upright rosemary, and you could have a trailing rosemary. You could have some coleus around the edge, or thyme even, to be the filler. You could try columnar basil with some marjoram and a sweet potato vine if you wanted to. Here's some combinations that work. This is purple sage and thyme. Again, these are both Mediterranean, so they don't need a lot of water. If you have this pot and there's another pot over here with basil, the basil is gonna need water about four times more often than this pot. Rosemary and Kent Beauty, great combination. Parsley and chives, they need a little more water, so they do fine together also. This is a big container, it's deceptive, and they have a lot of plants planted here and they're all doing fine. So there's curly and flat leaf parsley, curly parsley, flat leaf parsley here. This is some golden sage and tricolor sage, some thyme and rosemary. This is a lovely container. And they're all Mediterranean herbs, except for the parsley. So it doesn't need a ton of water. Now using your herbs, for parsley, for smaller leafed varieties, basil and so forth, cut the outer stems right down to the ground. It's not gonna hurt the plant at all. You want to use for cooking purposes, you wanna use the most tender, small leaves. They're gonna be the sweetest and the most flavorful. Basil, this is how you cut basil. I love this picture. This is a leaf node. This is where the leaves come off the stem. You cut right above that, as close to the leaves as you can. You don't wanna cut here and leave this empty stem. First of all, it's not very attractive. Second of all, it can uh, promote disease or insect coming in. So cut right above the leaf node. Most other herbs, this is tarragon, cut back the young top growth several times during the season. And so that encourages the plant to grow more and uh, you get the best flavor if you're using for cooking. If you're going to make a big harvest, and again, I'm not going to talk a ton about harvesting. I'm not going to have time. Water the plants the day before if you're going to have a big harvest. This will keep them from being stressed out when you harvest them. Some herbs dry quite well. You can freeze others. And this, a lot of this harvesting information is on our website. I'm just, again, I do a whole talk about preserving herbs. So I'm not gonna go into vast detail because I'm sure there are questions, um, but I want to tell you that there's a lot of information out there about harvesting and, uh, and germinating seeds and growing from stems and all kinds of other information. But we concentrated just on growing with containers today. So this is my favorite quote. I use this at the end of all my talks. If you don't have dirty knees, you need to reevaluate your priorities, says Calvin. And I love this picture. You know those people are happy, happy campers. So I'm going to close my screen and I'll look at the chat room and take any questions that we may have. And uh, oh, fantastic. We've got a couple, okay. actually, some really good ones. Would yeah. you repeat the plants that dry with retention of color? And what type of pots? will withhold freezing temperature without breaking. Well, that's the thing about a, cer a ceramic pot will often break. Terracotta usually does okay. Well, I like the plastic, the polyurethane pots. First of all, they don't break, they don't crack, they're lighter in weight. That's what I prefer. As for the flowers that dry and hold their color, there were two. And, and Erica, didn't I send you a handout for this? I thought I did send you a handout. If I didn't, I will, and you can send it out to the participants. Um, I have a whole handout with all these herbs mentioned and all these details. So if you miss something, it's fine. You didn't really miss anything at all. Um, the plants that will hold their color are called gomphrena or globe flower. Gomphrena, G-O-M-P-H-R. E-N-A, Gomfrina, and it comes, I, we have the buddy purple, but it comes in pink and some other colors too. The other one is called, it's an ornamental oregano, it's called Kent Beauty, two words, K-E-N-T, Beauty, oregano. It's lovely, I really love it. Okay, 
what else? Let's see. Tips for harvesting cilantro. You would harvest cilantro the same way you would parsley. Just cut those, uh, the most tender leaves. And when it starts to bolt, it's going to get bitter and you might as well just throw it out and start again. Would you compost pars or uh, cilantro? Sure, you can compost anything. You can even compost mint. Okay. If you don't <laughs> put it at the top of your compost pot, I would make sure that it's well covered because you don't want it to sprout in there. I mean, I've had, I've had tomatoes grow out of my compost bin, you know. Uh, I see somebody else agreed with me about the taste of cilantro. Yes. Yes. And are there any herbs that don't require full sun? There are only a few. One that doesn't require sun at all, that does fine under a tree, not a, well, a, you know, not a extremely shady tree, is called sweet woodruff, W-O-O-D-R-U-F-F. -F. This is a plant that needs to be in shade and it has a sweet little flower in the spring. Uh, it does fine in the shade. Parsley can take some afternoon shade. Uh, what else can take some afternoon shade? Thyme can take a little bit of shade. All of these plants need some sun though. They, they just don't do well in full shade except for that sweet woodruff as far as I know. But again, um, there are so many resources out there for you. If you look up herbs to plant in the shade, they may give you a fuller list than what I'm telling you right now. Do all mints take over? Mm. That's what they want to do if you want them. <laughs> um, like the or orange chocolate types you talked about. Yes, all mints, all mints have that really great growth. <laughs> really extravagant growth of their root system. So if you don't keep that contained, the thing about their oregano, which is a relative, and lemon balm, which is a relative, they don't spread underground the way that mint does. Um, and you can block them with physical barriers like bricks or a board or something. But mint will send its little roots and then send up a shoot over you know, five feet away. Just saying, if all you wanted was mint, now mint in the summer will, will turn kind of yellow. It doesn't like the hot, real heat of August, late August. But sometimes if that's what your mint looks like when it first comes out, it's because it's pot bound, root bound, and you need to get it into a bigger pot or divide it. I have a windowsill herb garden kit that comes with small plastic containers. Well, that's all fine for starting. Remember, your feet need some room and so do the feet of the plant. So once they get going, you'll probably need to transplant them. And most herbs, by and large, do not do very well inside, even with grow lights. They need full sunlight. Many plants do fine inside and, and some of these might do, lemon verbena does fine in the winter inside in my south facing window. But these small little containers are for starting. They're really adorable. And then they're too little. <laughs> uh, okay. Somebody wants to know when is harvesting class? We might have to schedule that one, Mary. <laughs> well, I think I'll just have to schedule that. You know, I like to do that in the midsummer because a lot of herbs like basil, for example, if you're going to make pesto and freeze it, you want to do that before the plant really starts to bloom in earnest. Any, any of these herbs have their best flavor right before they flower. And of course, that happens at different times of the season. So uh, I do a lot of harvesting in the late summer. And I dry a lot of my herbs, just dry them. I use cardboard box lids and paper towels and let them dry in a single layer in a dark place and label them because when they're dry, they all look the same. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> any herbs that deter dogs? Mm, no, but as I said, deer and rabbits for the most part will not bother your herb plants. They're too strong. They have strong odors. Some of them have leaves that they don't like. Now, that being said, when my parsley is baby 
and my dear little babies, the baby bunnies might also come and nibble at those. So I put a little cage around those. Rosemary, the deer won't even bother rosemary or, or lavender. So unless they're starving to death. Um, so dogs, not so much. I uh, can't think of anything that would deter a dog. You know, cats like cat mint, of course, and they will. Even tigers and lions like cat mint. It's really funny. Um, but dogs, I think a fence is going to be your only solution for rabbits, too, in, in your vegetable garden. Uh, what kind of fertilizer? Oh, that's a good question. I, I mentioned it really early on, but most of these herbs don't need any fertilizer. And if they do, it would be once every couple of years if you're growing in a container. That would be once a season with osmocote. These herbs, these Mediterranean herbs in particular, they are used to having to struggle a little bit. They don't have rich soil and you just don't need it. I don't, I don't ever fertilize my herbs, even in the pots. So there, you have that. What's a natural herbicide for bugs on herbs? Most bugs don't bother herbs. If they are, they might be beneficial. Insects, they might deter other insects that will damage your plants. I would never use an herbicide on anything I was going to eat, and I never do. In fact, I don't use herbicides at all or pesticides in my garden. Um, that being said, if you have some pests, you can use a, a spray of soapy water with a little vinegar. That won't kill the plant, but it will hurt the bugs. Parsley and many of herb, herbal plants, not the culinary ones so much, but parsley in particular is the host plant for a black swallowtail butterfly. So, you know, I just wash my parsley really carefully when I bring it in because that green of that caterpillar matches that parsley leaf exactly. So be careful. But I don't use any kind of sprays. That's one of the reasons that I love my herb garden because I don't have to do, I'm lazy. I don't want to do all that stuff. And, uh, you know, the other weeds that grow in between the pavers, well, yeah, that's different. That's, you know, you could use something on that, but a weed killer on that. But I never put anything on my herbs and they seem to do fine. Anything else? I think I got them all. That is fantastic. Before I let Mary go, I do want to remind everybody that she will be back on April 21st, which is a Wednesday, um, for a program about lavender, which we are very excited about. And then again in May. Yeah. So for the War and Legends of Herbs. And yes. Which, which one is that one in May? Oh, the Lore and Legend. That's right. Um, yep. That's and just a fun one. We've got, were, oh yeah, the herbal cookbook. That's right. You have that in your have, system. We do. Everything else is checked out. Yeah. Or, or yeah. for a fun trip, they're all upstairs in our rare books room too. Okay. Make an appointment and come up and see them. We keep them all there, which is fantastic. That's great. Um, there's, we'll, uh, Erica, we'll schedule one about harvesting. We can do that in, I would suggest late July. Or Sounds good. Yes. In there because you can start harvesting in the middle of the summer, excuse me, in the middle of the summer. Um, and I'll send you a couple other possibilities that, that I do too. I do a decorating with herbs class. That's kind of fun. And that's, that's, that includes some arrangements, but also a lot of how to do crafty sort of things, how to make a wreath, how to, um, no, I'm blanking. How to do many other things that I've forgotten what I'm talking about now. Um, so, oh, pressing, you know, some herbs make good pressed flowers, some dry well. Uh, so, and then of course there's a whole cooking, just cooking with herbs class. And that's all we talk about is what you, how you use them for cooking purposes. So I will send you as soon as we get off this meeting, Erica, I'll send you the handout that goes with this, which, I'm so sorry I didn't send it out sooner, but everybody that that will give you all this information in a nutshell. And um, one last question before I before we say goodbye. Um, remind me, what is the pink herb behind you? Oh, this is called Dianthus. And this is um, it's also just called pink. 
but the the cultivar it's my it's this comes in a lot of different colors this is called one word fire witch f-i-r-e-w-i-t-c-h it is a hardy perennial i have it in the back of my gazebo here in some of my um, big tub planters comes back and as i say this is this is just budding out now next week a week from now it'll be in full bloom again you don't do anything to this plant and it's so thick that a weed can't even grow in these pots so i think that's you know that's the best fantastic <laughs> that is fantastic yeah all right everybody thank you very much you'll get a you'll get a nice um little handout in a little bit <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. Enjoy your gardens, everybody. Bye-bye.